This is Nick Black. I'm in Los Angeles, the Koreatown part of Los Angeles, and talking to Mary Warrenoff. Mary, thank you very much for taking time to talk with us. Thank you. Now, we know you best from your acting. Was that the field that you initially chose when you were a young lad? I didn't really choose it. I wanted to be an artist. And so I started in, uh, well, I left college and uh, went straight to Warhol. And he was in the midst of stopping his work and going into film. And so I started to do films with him. And I thought they were art projects. I still didn't think that I was an actress. How did you come to Warhol? What they did is they sent us to different studios, like Rauschenberg Studio and Jasper John's Studio. And then they also sent us to Warhol Studio. When I entered Warhol Studio, it was really funny because all the other studios were really white and Warhol's was like really black. And there was no art on the wall whatsoever. There was tinfoil on the wall. It was really dirty and you couldn't even see the end of it. And then this guy that I had met before, Gerard Malenga, came out and he said, hi. And I said, hi. And he said, Annie's doing screen tests. Do you want to do one? And I said, yeah. So I didn't go home with my class. I stayed. <laughs> Did your family know of this? And if they would have, they probably wouldn't have perhaps approved. Or... My family really did not approve of my leaving Cornell, but I was paying for my own tuition and they had no say in the matter. My mother was hip and knew that Andy was a famous artist and she thought, well, Mary, as you know, on her way, at least she's with a famous artist and she sort of backed me. She really did. But once she saw me in a play called Conquest of the Universe and she didn't think it was so good. And my grandmother saw me in Chelsea Girls and, you know, just thought that this was the end of the world. <laughs> what was Conquest of the Universe? Conquest of the Universe was this ridiculous play it was actually called the theater of the ridiculous and it was very gay oriented and i was the conqueror of the universe meaning i could do whatever i wanted on dean played the queen of mars and the chorus line you know was basically nude and had giant phalluses attached to them and were screaming most of the time one of the people there ate something out of a bucket which was i mean it wasn't really shit but everything they could think of at that time well this is the time of the living theater so everything they could think of to upset or excite the audience or even to the point where they would break their lines and enter into the audience, sit down and try and play chess with their head. But it's not really well documented. There's something called queer theater. It was radical. It was very, very radical. So you auditioned for Andy Warhol and tell us about the factory. I didn't audition for him. Gerard would come to me. Well, Gerard started going with me and Gerard said, look, I'm dancing with the Velvet Underground. You'll be my partner dancing. And actually Gerard, he wanted to be in movies, in these movies, and he realized he needed a female star. So I was going to be it. So that was his agenda. Meanwhile, we sort of were romantic together. Not really romantic, but for the time we were. So he gave me black leather pants, he gave me the bull whip, and we danced for the velvets. And I was doing all of this as an art performance. And then in the movies, Andy would invite me to be in the movies, but not Gerard, which upset him greatly, but there was nothing he could do about it. And pretty soon I was considered one of Andy's women. And Gerard was relegated to being sort of my agent. And he said, Look, 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 Andy's going to pick the next Edie Sedgwick, and you have to be it. We were sort of encouraged to fight amongst ourselves in order. And I said, no. I said, all of these girls are wrong. They're not going to get any acting career out of this. I would like to do these parts, but I'm not going to fight. And Gerard was really, really mad. But Andy still gave me roles because, see, Andy was interested in all of these things like gender slippage, bad sound, anything that was negative, not negative, but against what the 50s film world was doing. That's what he liked. I mean, instead of lots of sex and free sex, he liked S&M and not him particularly, but as a theme for his movies. I was definite gender slippage. I mean, he had a lot of men posing as women, but I was certainly the only girl who dressed and acted like a guy. Also, I had tremendous presence, but it was scary presence. It wasn't your typical victim kind of presence. So he used me a lot. As a matter of fact, he used me until Paul Morrissey came over and said, you have to sign this release, otherwise we can't do this book. And I said, you're full of it. I'm not signing anything. And I told my mom, and she said, oh, this is it. He's using you. We're going to sue him. So <laughs> she proceeded to sue him. Of course, they settled out of court. And then Andy, being the cheap person he was, refused to use me anymore. Was he paying you a salary? How did that work? No, no, no. He did not pay me a salary. I don't know what I survived on. I mean, it's easy for a girl to survive. You live with guys and they pay for you or, you know, <laughs> buy your drugs or whatever. And I could always go home. I didn't need help. I know that Andy paid some of the queens who were really were desperate. I mean, they were living on ashes and coffee or whatever. He would give them money, but not a lot. Nobody was paid. And for me, that was fine because then I wasn't being used as long as I wasn't being paid. I would do what I want. I would bring what I want to the set, etc., and so on. But once he had us sign releases and not pay us, 
that was like a warning light in my head uh, that was, I'm going to sign everything away and not be part of this, then pay me. And he didn't. What was he like in general as a person? He was really shy. He was brilliant. Brilliant in the way that he did not do what was expected. He always did the opposite. He was interested in destroying things rather than keeping certain things around. For instance, the way he directed, instead of telling you what to do, what he did is he never told you what to do. And then you would start doing all these things to try and attract his camera, and you would do the most bizarre things. And that's probably what his movies were about, getting that kind of quality out of you. Because he didn't use real actors, so that you didn't know whether these people were freaks or were they acting, and therefore when you don't know these things, then you begin to see different things. And he really was quite brilliant, I think. He himself, he was a workaholic. He never took a vacation. He never knew how to take any kind of pleasure. The only pleasure he had was gossiping with Bridget and buying things. He was a compulsive buyer. He always seemed to me to be unhappy and made me feel was tremendously protective of him. For some reason, and he certainly didn't need my protection, <laughs> but for some reason I felt that I had to protect him. And I knew that many, many people felt that way about him. What about the other personalities? Because they've all turned into folk hero freaks in a way, haven't they? Viva, Ultraviolet, and Edie Sedgwick. All of those girls did not become actresses. I did. I hope I'm not a freak folk hero. <laughs> <laughs> but I might be. I can't tell. <laughs> you know, you, you never know what crown is being handed to you. But, well, of course, many people didn't have a good ending. They died. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't like to talk about what happened to them. I mean, some people are fine. Gerard's fine. Billy Name is fine. I mean, Andine is dead, and he was the most powerful of all of them. But most of them were gay, and they were very much on the edge. They were very... I mean, this is a time when everything was restricted. Sex was just beginning not to be restricted, but certain homosexual sex was very restricted. And these queens were mad. They were furious. How did they all come to end? What happened is, Billy Name... <laughs> Well, actually, he's the one responsible for bringing people to the factory. And then Gerard brought all the girls to the factory, like he brought me. Different people would know other people, especially through the amphetamine circuit. And they would bring them to the factory. And pretty soon we got this name of being this underground, fabulous place. And then people started coming. People would just come from nowhere, just drawn there. And other people would come. Very rich people would come down and sort of look like squares, and we'd have to throw them away. Let's get on to a few of the more normal films, such as Chemic, Sugar Cookies, Silent Night, Bloody Night. Can you just quickly tell us a bit about these now obscure films, I assume, unless they're out on DVD, Mary, are they? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know if they are. Sugar Cookies, I remember people would say, hey, I saw you in Sugar Cookies, and I'd go, oh, yeah, where? And they'd say, well, I was in this motel, and they had all these sex movies, and Sugar Cookies was there. <laughs> so, and here, Sugar Cookies was made by a man I was married to. He said, I'm going to make a movie that you're going to be the star of. I said, oh, fine, this is going to be fabulous. Mm -hmm. And he had me screwing this girl with a gun, and... <laughs> It was. And playing a lesbian to boot, I said, is this how my husband sees me? My God. <laughs> and then Kemet is done by the same guy, but that movie was genius. It really was. It was done in Italy, and it was about 60s in Italy, these bizarre people floating around the world. And it was a great movie. And what happened is the producer owned it, and he died, and therefore his family sold it to someone, and they chopped it to ribbons and made this other movie out of it. So that doesn't exist. Only the mangled version exists. And then Silent and I Bloody Night was a horror film. I'm sure that exists. People watch it on Christmas. <laughs> All right, well, then you went on to do a film called Seizure, and that was the first film of a gentleman we all know now because he's a big Hollywood player, as they call him, Oliver Stone. Do you have any recollections of Oliver Stone and Seizure? Yes, Oliver Stone and Seizure. Oliver was this very nice boy. Uh, <laughs> yes, he was a boy. And this was his first movie, and he was very excited about it, and he wanted reality. And, of course, it was this movie about this nightmare that happened to all these people, and he said, in order to produce this, you'll all live together in this house, so we'll go up to Canada and you'll all have to stay with each other and you'll never get a break from each other and you'll drive each other crazy and therefore the movie will be fabulous. And, <laughs> and did it work that way? No! <laughs> We all hated each other and drove each other crazy, and the movie was terrible. <laughs> Around this time, you did a film called Death Race 2000. Was that your first time with Paul Bartel? Paul called me up, and he said, Look, you fly yourself out here to California. I will put you in the movies. I said, Fine, fine, fine. Did you know each other already? Oh, yes. Yeah, he was a friend of my husband, and he had produced a movie called Secret Cinema, and I saw that movie. It was the most paranoid movie I ever saw. It was fabulous. I thought, This guy's a genius. So anyway, then he called me up, and he says that, and I just had this terrible love affair with this guy that I was really in love with so I said fine I want to get out of here I never want to see New York again so I went to California and they put me in this movie and it was about cars and I'm from 
New York. I don't know how to drive a car. And it was about race cars, racing around the country, and everybody else could drive. And I had to be towed by a truck because I didn't know how to drive. It was so humiliating. But that was my first movie, yeah, for Corman. And it was fun? Oh, yeah, it was great fun for me. It was bizarre. I remember Corman never came on the set. I never saw him. And then all of a sudden he showed up because Sylvester Stallone would not show his ass in the massage scene. And he walked over to him and he said, all my movies are about tits and ass. And Sylvester showed his ass. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still doing it to this day. Also, you did another film called Hollywood Boulevard, and that was another first-time film. Oh, boy, if it wasn't his first time, very close to first. Joe Dante, do you have any recollections of Hollywood Boulevard? Hollywood Boulevard was done because Joe Dante and Alan Arkish, who were relegated to the editing room, never allowed to see the light of day, they came to Corman like little mice. They said, oh, look, 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 we can make this movie in one week because we'll use outtakes of all these other movies. And Corman said, all he has to hear, he said, fine, do it. And so they made this movie completely satirizing Roger Corman and his kind of movies. And I would shoot a gun, Takeoka Park, which is right around the corner. And then they would put in outtakes of thousands of Philippines falling out of palm trees, dying and bleeding. And But I never saw them. And they made that movie that way. It was fabulous. One of my favorite movies. It has a terrible plot, but it's really funny. Also around this time that you were doing a lot of these low-budget independent films, but you were also doing more mainstream movies, sort of smaller parts. You're one of the few people that sort of would have been able to cross over. Yes, well, I've asked myself this question, why didn't you cross over? <laughs> and I have no reason. I don't know. I seriously tried. I didn't try that hard. I was too busy still trying to be an artist. And I had a lot of other things to do. I just, I seriously didn't try that hard. If people offered me parts, I'd do them. No, I had other things. Punk rock just happened. I was really interested in that. That wasted a lot of time. And then there was art. And most of my friends were in the art world. My acting was always bizarre. It was always strange. And then I became very proud of the fact that it was always these independent films. They have a longer life, don't they? Because they have these fans that stick with them. Well, also that and the fact that when you work on them, you can do what you like, pretty much. You can be very creative. You can't do that in Hollywood. In Hollywood, the director has a vision and you have to tap into it and then do what he wants. Not that I mind doing that. I mean, that's what acting's all about. But the other ones were always wacky and I really liked them. Well, speaking of punk rock, you had the Ramones in Rock and Roll High School where you played Miss Togar and she was a rather wicked lady. But I want to ask you about Heartbeats another Alan Arkash film, that they did star was Andy Kaufman. Now, we've seen Man on the Moon. Was he a crazy guy like that? I have to tell you that I know only as much as you know about him because I never met him on the set. All my scenes were not with him. You met him at the rap party? Didn't go to the rap party. That movie was sad because it never really took off. There was something wrong about it. Probably because it was a big budget movie. Then we had another low budget, but a very successful film in Australia, Eating Rayol, where you played Paul Bartel's wife, The Blands. When I spoke to Paul, he said that was by far and away his most successful film financially. Do you get an inkling of that when it's finished or during or it's just another film? When Paul first showed me that, this is a piece of crap. And I realize now that I am not a good judge of scripts, not at all. I mean, I can write good scripts, but as far as realizing what it's going to be like, I guess I'm not really all there. Then when we started doing it, for some reason all of us really, maybe it was a piece of crap. But anyway, when we started doing it, we started doing all of these things. We just hooked into something and we all knew that we hooked into things. And Paul at one point didn't have any money whatsoever and he said, all right, now I can't pay you. You can leave, but I have to tell you that I would really like to finish. And everybody stayed, everybody. So that proof that we all knew something was going on. Yes, we did. And then when it was finished, we loved it. All of us loved it. We knew that it was really, really good and then nobody in LA liked it. Europe liked it. England liked it. Australia liked it but New York sort of liked it and it was only much much later that Hollywood started saying oh yeah that's a cult favorite that we really really like. And bullshit. When it first came out nobody went to it. It was like terrible. Can't handle something a bit off center is that it? You know if I knew anything about them I would comment about them but <laughs> <laughs> they've always kept me in the dark. Another film by a first time director called Nomads and that was directed by John McTernan who's gone to bigger and better things. Any recollections of Nomads? It was an unusual film. Yeah. Nomads, I like that script. That script was great. It was about these bizarre people that if you look at them, they can enter your soul. And they're actually aliens. And it's from an old Eskimo myth. If you see someone on the ice, you're not supposed to approach him or look at him because he can take you over. I love that movie. That's where I got to dance on the car. That was really great. John McTernan, he was bizarre. He kept
kept on running around going, oh, I want this really bizarre, I want this really... But he would never tell us. All he would say is, I want this really bizarre. It was like he didn't really know. But so finally, Adam Ant and I just did what we wanted to do. And it turned out really good. But the movie wasn't that successful. No, no, it wasn't. But he went on to bigger things. Plus, I want to get on to Glory Days. Do you remember Glory Days? With Ben Affleck and Matthew McConaughey in minor roles, 1996. Glory Days. Yeah. This isn't the only movie that I've never heard of. People come up to me all the time and yeah, say, weren't you in that? And I say no. And then they go, oh, yes, you were. And they're, they're usually right. But I can't remember everything. No, no, no. Okay. No. All right. But you do remember the month of scary little Christmas. You went to Australia. So tell us about your Australian trip, Mary. I loved Australia. I went to the Blue Mountains. I have friends in the Blue Mountains. Oh, the whole place. I just loved it. I really did. It was great. The movie was just ridiculous. But <laughs> that often happens to me. I mean, I did television. I loved Italy, but the movie was ridiculous. Oh, God, not again. But the money was good? Yeah, the money's yeah. always good. And tell me, I've just looked you up on the Internet Movie Database, and there's a film called Citizens of Perpetual Indulgence, which has just got a fabulous title. Fabulous title, really bad movie. Mm -hmm. You know what else, though? I have to say another thing. When I was in Australia, the crew was men and women, and they were on equal footing. And this is still not true in America, but in Australia it was. Why is that, Mary? I don't know. We're antiquated here. What can I say? <laughs> It's the old boys' trip. Australia was just great. They were great. They really were. That's an inspiration for some of your paintings because you've been painting for a long, long time. The only thing that inspires my paintings is deep inside my skull, and I don't know what the hell it is. I just do it. Because I don't use models. I don't use reality at all. It's all inside my brain. Possibly it's too personal, and that's why people can't really handle it. But it's figurative. It's, it's lush. It's beautiful. But there's always something going on that's totally twisted. Like that painting over there. <laughs> I call it a picnic. It's actually my mother, my brother, and me at a picnic. But if you see the painting, I mean, my mother's obviously on a cross. <laughs> She's crucified, yes, and there are all these birds floating around. So you see, I mean, there's always something. Have you had formal training? Yeah, that's why I went to Cornell. Yeah. You're fairly successful with it, aren't you? I mean, financially. Yeah. Yeah. No, the last two years, I haven't really done that much movie work. I've supported myself by painting. But the big thing in the last couple of years is writing. Tell us about your books, Mary. Uh, no, and I'll tell you about my writing. What's really weird is I never wrote before, and then I had this operation, and they looked at my liver and said, you shouldn't drink anymore. So I stopped everything. I even stopped smoking. I became so focused that I started writing, and it's like a whole new life. I've done three books. One is short stories to my paintings. That was the first. Then the next one was Swimming on the Ground, and that was... Uh, fictional memoir about Warhol. That was the second one. That was quite popular. And Snake, which is a novel, my first novel. And I've already done my second novel. And I can't tell you I'm a really good writer. I think I'm a better writer than a painter or an actress. Wow. It's so bizarre. It's a big call. I know. I know. Well, I've gotten brilliant reviews. Any plans to come to Australia? To sign books? Oh, I would love to go back to Australia. I would love to. I just love Australia. It's so beautiful. It's so strange. It's so mystical. The only thing I don't like is the plane flight. It's too long. <laughs> Besides the writing, are you doing any more films at the moment, Mary, or what's happening with your film career? My film career is so bizarre. I mean, I never know what's going on. It's never planned. A movie called New Women. And it's a sci-fi movie where all of the men fall asleep for some reason and they cease to exist. It's all about these women. And I guess they fight at first and then it's so bizarre. I can't really describe it. But the director is brilliant. He's taken all these old movies and he's, each scene is about an old movie. It's so hard to describe. All right. Thank you very much, Mary Warnock. Thank you.